Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to everyone. Uh, my name is John Richardson. I'm the National Resilience Advisor uh, for Australian Red Cross uh, here. And I'd uh, really, really like to welcome you to uh, this um, International uh, Heat Action Day, uh, which is uh, run by Red Cross internationally. Uh, even though, of course, here and certainly in the southern part of the, the country, we're experiencing some pretty, pretty uh, uh, cold uh, and, and extreme sort of cold temperatures for, for Australia. So thanks for giving your time up uh, to, to come along today to talk about Heat, important to be talking about it at this sort of time uh, because this is sort of when we uh, when we should be sort of planning. Um, there's at least uh, over 400 people have registered for this, so it's great to sort of see that there's uh, there's the interest. Uh, before I um, go sort of uh, sort of further, um, I, I do want to sort of uh, acknowledge uh, the uh, that I'm hosting the event uh, from the lands of the Wurundjeri people. Uh, here in the Kulin Nation uh, in uh, Nam, or, or other people might know it as Melbourne. Uh, and I'd also like to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands in which you all uh, join from, uh, and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, participating again uh, in this event today. Um, the oldest uh, living cu culture uh, uh, in the world has been um, living with sort of fire, flood, heat uh, and dispossession and disease for 60,000 years. So there's certainly uh, a lot that we can uh, learn from. Before we uh, get to uh, the, the important stuff, I do want to run through sort of a couple of sort of housekeeping things. Um, today's event uh, is going to be recorded and can be made available, uh, will be made available after the event so you can sort of share it. Uh, with uh, friends, family, and interested bystanders, um, we're going to have the uh, we're going to be using the Q and A um, feature on Zoom. Um, so if you've got a question, stick it in Q and A because that's the one we'll be looking at, and not the chat window. But of course, the chat window is there if you've got ideas or, or, or thoughts that you you, you want to have a conversation. I really encourage people to have a chat. But if you want to pose a question, uh, stick it in the Q and A box. Um, the other thing you can do, and one of the great things is uh, you can uh, you can upvote it. So use your use your thumb uh, to sort of get this uh, voted up, and we'll probably sort of try and go with those questions that are sort of voted up. So um, vote early, vote often, um, and also I suppose the other thing to mindful uh, to be really mindful of uh, is uh, to be respectful to each other and to to. Our, our presenters when when you're uh, posting sort of uh, comments or questions. So, so without sort of further ado, um, I, I do want to uh, get into the sort of substance of of today's webinar. And you know, heat is a is a really important topic for us to to, to be considering. Uh, you know, particularly uh, in the context of sort of a a changing climate. Uh, particularly in a context uh, in Australia of a uh, highly urbanised nation. And um, the, I, I suppose the quote that I always come back to is, is, um, is Eric Klinenberg, who did the study of the Chicago earthquake, uh, earthquake, sorry, heat wave, uh, and um, where he speaks about, you know, heat being a sort of silent killer uh, of a silent people. So uh, it, it, it does kill people, uh, it does have um, hidden sort of long-term consequences. And we're going to sort of hear about those, those today. So with that, I'm going to introduce our uh, first speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Rup Singh, as uh, a climate advisor for um, the Red Cross Red Crescent uh, Centre uh, in Climate Centre. Uh, and she's based in New York. So we do thank her, it's quite uh, late in the evening for her. Um, thank her. Uh, given that she's sort of been um, a big driver at Heat International, Heat Action, Heat Action Day, sorry. Um, I'm just back from leave. So, you know, the words aren't quite flowing the way they probably should be. Um, so apologies for that. So over to you, uh, Ruth, to talk about extreme heat, uh, the International Heat Action Day and, and resources that uh, we do have internationally. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, John, for inviting me and happy to be here and happy that Australia is the first to kick off an event for Heat Action Day. Um, so I'm joining from New York, as John mentioned, and 
it's nine o'clock at night, but um, super grateful to be here with all of you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about heat waves, what they are, what their impacts are, and what we're doing as a Red Cross Red Crescent movement as part of this heat action day. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Okay. So just to kick us off um, and make sure that we all have a um, common understanding, a heat wave is basically a period of hot or unusually humid weather that has some sort of negative impact on human health. If we go to the next slide, um, we'll see that heat waves are not the same around the world. So many of you are based in different cities in Australia and in Australia, perhaps 28 degrees Celsius is not considered very hot, but in London and the UK, that's actually what is considered a heat wave. If you have at least three consecutive days with a maximum temperature of 28 degrees um, or greater, that's a heat wave. London um, may reach this temperature um, later this week. There is a forecast for a heat wave in Europe. Um, whereas in Delhi and in India, a heat wave is when you actually get maximum temperatures that are much, much hotter, so 40 degrees Celsius or greater. This is just to say that while we commonly call heat waves a heat wave, it can vary quite a bit from place to place. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So oftentimes, one of the biggest issues that I face as someone who works on heat is that um, heat is sometimes like sugar. It's something that we actually really look forward to. We look forward to the summer because of the sunny days, the nice weather. Um, and so there's a tendency for us to then think sometimes that we're a little bit invincible. We, we think that the heat doesn't bother us. Maybe you're from a country that's already hot and so the hot weather is something that you're used to. Um, and so it's great to have heat in moderation, but then it can also be deadly. So if we go to the next slide, I wanna share with you a little bit about um, how, how deadly heat waves actually are around the world. So I did a bit of research and I found out that in Australia in particular, there have been at least 473 heat related deaths from the years 20, 2000 to 2018. Um, this is way too many. There shouldn't be any heat related deaths that we're seeing because many of these deaths are preventable. Um, and we also see that heat waves are second only to disease epidemics in terms of numbers of lives lost. Um, this is also the case around the world. So the European heat wave in 2003 was very much uh, a wake up call, I think, for Europe because of the massive numbers of people who ended up actually dying during that particular heat wave event. Um, the same is true in even more recent uh, extreme heat wave events. For example, you might remember last year in the US and Canada, there were over 100 deaths because of a very extreme heat wave in the Pacific Northwest. The reality is that we actually don't know exactly how many people die from heat related causes around the world because oftentimes those deaths aren't recorded. No one really writes heat wave as the cause of death on um, a death certificate. Often it's because people die from um, a pre-existing condition. Maybe they're diabetic or they have a heart or lung related condition, but the heat exacerbates that. Um, so those are one of the challenges that, another one of the challenges that we face. Um, if we go to the next slide, I also want to share a little bit about who's, what the impacts are. So in addition to the impacts to human health, we also have impacts to infrastructure. So the, the picture in the center is from Australia. I also have pictures from New Orleans where we've had power outages because of heat waves and in India where literally the roads have melted. So um, heat waves can result in infrastructure damage, power failure, reduce work capacity, and a myriad of other impacts that extend beyond just the impact to human health. Um, but can also have implications for society. So now that we understand the impacts, who's the most vulnerable? So if we go to the next slide, um, I'm going to share a couple of groups that we know to be most vulnerable. We know that infants are mo more vulnerable, but so, so are pregnant and lactating women. And that's because um, for lactating women in particular, um, you require a lot of water. Lactating is very dehydrating. 
For infants, they require us as adults to be the ones uh, ensuring that they're hydrated. Um, pregnant women are affected by extreme heat in their pregnancy. We know that too much heat can cause um, early labor, for example. Another group, if we go to the next slide, of people who are more vulnerable tends to be people who are older. Uh, so people who are over 65 tend to have a harder time regulating their body temperature. And so that's why we tend to focus a lot of heat wave messaging on older adults. Um, I think I have one more group. If we go to the next slide. Yes, so uh, many people work outdoors around the world, whether it's in construction, it's people working on farms and vineyards, um, in many other outdoor jobs. And if you're outdoors all the time, of course, you're more exposed and there are ways to sort of reduce your exposure. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so now that we have a sense of who's most vulnerable, we also know that climate change is making heat waves hotter and more frequent. So um, this, this um, map basically shows us areas around the world where we're starting to see um, where we're projected to see more days per year above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm in the US, so I'm using Fahrenheit, but, but essentially in many places around the world, it's getting hotter, particularly in places where it's already hot. So Australia is highlighted, but so are parts of Sub-Saharan Africa um, and uh, India and uh, the Middle East. If we go to the next slide, we'll also realize that it's not just a future problem, but it's actually a problem that's happening now. So many of the heat waves that we've seen in the past couple of years, scientists have now been able to sort of attribute them to climate change. So we know that, for example, Japan's 2018 heat wave could not have happened in a world without climate change. Um, these are just headlines from various um, news newspapers, but there's one on Australia amongst other places around the world. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, so it tends to be that um, cities are a focal point of our work on heat. And the reason why is that the built environment tends to absorb more heat and radiate it, radiates it out during the nighttime. And so we tend to see that cities are hotter. They're also the places where we see vulnerability is concentrated. So you often have lots of people perhaps working outdoors. Maybe you have informal settlements in some cities that make it so that people living in those cities are also more vulnerable and exposed than the surrounding countryside. Um, next slide, next slide, please. Okay, so now that you've heard all of the sort of bad things and sort of the impacts of people who are vulnerable and what we expect to see, um, I think one of the most important messages that I can share is that actually a lot of the heat related deaths that we see are preventable. There's so many different actions that we can take as a society, personal protective actions, but also institutional ones to reduce heat related deaths. So I want to share a couple of those with you. Um, if we, we can go to the next slide. So there's tons of different ways to cool off. I'm just sharing a couple of examples. So these are from um, Saudi Arabia and Iraq where temperatures get really, really hot during the summer. Um, and many people are going to these places for religious pilgrimages or just because they live there. And so one of the ways that they cool off is they have misting fans to increase sort of evaporative cooling or they have literally people who will who have like outdoor showers. So those are very, um, I guess, low cost ways to uh, cool off. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I can share a couple of additional ones. Um, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement around the world is taking action um, through many different simple actions. So one of the things that the Indian Red Cross is doing is actually just putting on um, these drives where they actually offer people water when it gets very hot, there's a heat wave going on. The Vietnam Red Cross and the middle example is providing cooling centers. They have a cooling bus where, where you can hop on the bus, it's air conditioned, and you can go to a cooling center where there are medical workers um, and you can get checked out if you might um, have a heat related illness, for example. And then the last example is um, many Red Cross national societies around the world are the ones that do first aid. And so learning the signs of a heat stroke or of another heat related illness are really important, being able to recognize that in yourself and in others. Um, so they, they're doing training for 
um, heat related illnesses. So th those are just a couple of examples. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so today, June 14th is the first heat action day where Red Cross, Red Crescent National Societies around the world are basically trying to raise awareness of why heat is such a risk, but also the fact that there are so many simple ways in which you can reduce that risk. So today we're going to have at least 50 flash mobs um, in cities and towns around the world from Nigeria to Italy to the United States. Um, to Japan. So we're super excited to see people out on the streets and actually talking about this issue. The IFRC President Roca is going to be giving a press briefing on this later today. Um, and you can join us by joining the social media campaign um, on how to beat the heat. If we can put the, the link to the heat action day in the chat bar. Um, and I guess to end there, are, we've got tons of resources on how you can be involved to learn about heat waves. Uh, we have campaign materials, case studies and other things um, that you can use to sort of join in. Thank you. Thanks, Roop. Uh, a whole lot to get through there. Um, thank you for um, uh, rushing through that. Uh, it's a, you know, obviously Big complex topic, particularly when you're looking at it for, uh, from an international perspective. So thank you. Um, Rup will be coming back on later on with, uh, through the quest question and answer. So think about your questions, Rup. Um, I'd now like to introduce Brad Santos uh, from the Bureau of Meteorology, who's going to talk to us about uh, the heat wave warning service that uh, the uh, Bureau of Meteorology have been uh, working on for the last couple of years and give us a sense of uh, what it's all about. So uh, thank you, Brad. Thank you very much, John. And uh, thank you, Dr. Singh. I think uh, Dr. Singh really set the scene very well. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please, Greg. So why a heatwave warning service? I think there are very strong reasons to have a heatwave warning service, but just with a few more details, Extreme heat waves have killed 5,332 people in Australia between 1844 and 2010. And since 1900, heat waves have actually killed more people in Australia than the sum of all natural hazards. Another point is that the reduced product, labour productivity is by far the largest cost of heat waves in Australia, with an estimated of $8.7 billion or 0 0.3 to 0.4% of GDP. And as alluded to before by Dr. Singh, uh, climate change has already made heat waves more frequent and more prolonged and more intense. And these trends are likely to continue over the next decade. We go to the next slide. Thanks, Greg. So in terms of agency roles, uh, particularly for state and territory governments, um, some of those roles include issuing safety messages to the public, uh, issuing heatwave warnings aligned with the Australian warning system, including more targeted or nuanced messaging to vulnerable communities and stakeholders, and standing up uh, resources and indeed additional resources. So the Bureau will certainly assist agencies in delivering these roles and helping them prepare and deliver their services to the community. If we go to the next slide, please, Greg. So the Bureau consulted with a wide range of stakeholders, particularly from the health and emergency services sector. We held a series of workshops with the agencies you can see on the screen. Uh, there were over 40 participants across the health emergency services and local government agencies. There was a very high res response rate and very good engagement from all those stakeholders. And that really helped us plan and develop our heatwave warning services from within the Bureau. We go to the next slide, please, Greg. In terms of community engagement, and I think the key word here is partnership and working as a team. So the Bureau's community engagement and hazard preparedness and response teams will document the engagement initiatives uh, to complement existing planned communication actions. Um, we'll also assist in mapping priority heatwave risk areas and understanding community demographics in identified areas. They'll also help gather community and industry sentiment about the new heatwave warning services, which are planned to be delivered in the 2022 and 23 season. 
and that will also help to inform continuous improvement, which is important for any service. We'll also help to develop strategies and partnership, again, to connect with at-risk, vulnerable and underrepresented groups from within the community. And also an important point is to share this information with partner agencies such as health and emergency services. If we go to the next slide, please, Greg. So in terms of the trial heatwave warning service, um, I think we got went one too far, Greg. If we go back one slide, thank you. The trial heatwave warning service. So this commenced on the 1st of December, 2021 and ran through to the end of March, 2022. During this service, the Bureau issued trial heatwave warnings to health and emergency sector stakeholders. And we were warning for severe and extreme heatwaves. It's probably a good point to step back. And in terms of warning for heat waves, the Bureau uses the excess heat factor as a way of classifying heat waves. Very simply, the excess heat factor measures how significant the heat is at a particular location compared to normal, and that's the significance index, and then how much of a shock to the system the heat is compared to what the community has experienced over the previous month, and that's the acclimatization index. So the Bureau was warning for severe and extreme heat waves. There was a lot of communication and engagement both internally and externally, and that really helped set the foundation for preparing for a public heat wave service plan for the 22-23 season. There was also a heat wave decision support product, which was sent um, to health agencies, and that was a more detailed forecast and warning service, which helped identify, for example, the percentage area. It looks like we may have lost Brad. Uh, he's going from Perth. I don't know. If, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll just wait to see whether he un unfreezes. Um, otherwise, not quite sure what's ha happened there. All right, so what we will do uh, is we'll move on to um, the next speaker, um, Alana Pedler, who's uh, the um, the operations coordinator for uh, Red Cross in South Australia. She's going to talk to us about uh, Telecross Ready. Uh, I've heard <coughs> Alana speak many times and um, uh, yeah, never, never tire it. So, Alana, if you can step into the breach while we see if we can find Brad to, to finish off, uh, that would be great. Thanks, John. Thanks for the uh, interesting introduction. Uh, John and I have worked together quite a while now, so I, I think it becomes a bit more funny to introduce each other. Um, so today I'm just looking at the Telecross Ready heatwave service that we run here in South Australia with the Red Cross. Uh, next slide, thanks. Um, the program started back in 2009. Uh, we in South Australia experienced some pretty record high temperatures in a 13 day heat wave, which they attributed to a, a significant increase in mortality across South Australia uh, for those people who are more vulnerable to the impacts of heat stress. We were contacted by the Department of Human Services here in South Australia and um, a request went forward to uh, come up with a service that we could support our more vulnerable community members. Um, so we made some uh, welfare calls to some registered clients over that summer, checking on their uh, health status and uh, escalate that if, if they required extra support. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, from the success of that initial trial, um, the Telecross Ready Heatwave Service has developed since then, and we've run that uh, every summer since 2009 now. Next slide, thanks. So a quick summary of how the service actually runs. So it's, um, it's a telephone-based support service where our volunteers call people who have already pre-registered throughout the year um, as highly vulnerable, a bit isolated, don't have that support service and mechanisms around them. It's people who can check in on them during those extreme heat uh, days. 
and um, provide some welfare support. It, the, uh, the outcome of the service is to reduce uh, mortality rates and hopefully reduce the number of people that require hospital admissions during what is usually pretty peak, uh, peak time for our hospitals and our health services during extreme weather, especially in South Australia. Um, we also use that time to um, <clears throat> educate our vulnerable community about how they can look after themselves in the lead up to the extreme weather events and in summer. The lead up to the extreme so, weather events in summer. So, oh, I'm hearing a bit of repeat for myself at the moment. Um, so uh, the service is designed just to, to be that link for people that sometimes have fallen through the cracks of other support services and just providing that extra uh, assurance that they there is someone checking in on them on those extreme weather days, especially in heat waves in South Australia. Next slide, please. So briefly, just as I mentioned, the eligibility for this service, it's mostly looking at those frail aged um, people who are isolated, they're living alone, they don't have that support mechanisms around them. They don't have friends or family that live nearby that can come and check in on them or take them out during extreme weather events. Um, they're highly vulnerable. They might have other health concerns that are significantly impacted um, more so during heat events. Uh, they might be recovering from surgery or illness at home and they don't have the mechanisms around them to support them. So they do rely on our, our Red Cross volunteers just doing that check-in calls during those significant events. Next slide, please. Um, we wouldn't be Red Cross if we didn't talk about preparedness. So one part of our service is ahead of summer, we contact our pre-registered clients and we provide them some extra check-in as about how they're prepared for the upcoming summer, talk about how they, what kind of tips and tricks they can do to keep themselves safe during extreme heat events, but also um, talking to them about what some of those indicators are about extreme heat illness. So what heat stroke sounds like, what it feels like and talk through with them what they're going to do for themselves if they start to feel some of those impacts. Who can they call? Who else around them in the neighbourhood that they might also want to refer into the service? And what other support networks they might be able to build on in the lead up to summer as another preventative way to, to keep themselves safe during our extreme heat days. Next slide, thanks. This is a bit of an overview of how the service actually runs. Um, we have an enormous a very compassionate group of trained volunteers across the state that we engage. So when a heat wave is declared by the Department of Human Services and we're activated, our volunteers jump on and they make these wellbeing calls uh, to our pre-registered clients across the state, which is basically um, a series of phone calls where they go through a wellbeing assessment. It's a series of survey questions just to see how people are, how are going during the heat wave. Are they aware what else is um, available to them? How are they actually feeling? Do they need any extra supports during that, that period? Um, and what's more important for this particular service is what happens next. So if people indicate during those phone calls that they are actually feeling unwell and they do need help, that we will then go on and call an ambulance if required, or the escalation process might be that we have um, a close contact, a family, friend, neighbor, someone nearby that has agreed to be their, their, their point of contact person, and they will go around and check on them and see if they need any extra support or help. Um, if someone doesn't answer the phone uh, within 90 minutes of three phone calls, then we can escalate it further to either a police call out or an ambulance call out just to go and check on their welfare. So each of those escalation processes looks slightly different depending on um, the, the client and what is available to them. And that's decided in that pre-registration period as to what, um, how we might escalate to keep them safe during the extreme weather events. Next slide, please. So this is just a quick summary of what uh, an average summer has looked like for us over the last few years. So during the summer of 2021, we had three activations. They went over a space of eight days um, in total. We made close to 2,500 phone calls, which did result in over 400 escalations to those emergency contacts. So that could be a neighbour, the local GP, a family or friend, someone who can go through and check on um, someone because they're not doing very well or we can't get hold of them. We need to make sure that they're safe. And another 30 plus uh, phone calls to either the police or ambulance to go do a welfare check. Um, and since 2009, we have made a number of those police or ambulance welfare checks where it has resulted in someone has been very unwell or even possibly unconscious and they have got them off to hospital in time. So we have managed to um, quite literally save a few lives over the years, which has been quite, um, uh, quite inspiring as to why the service continues to develop and to grow. Next slide, please. 
Um, this is just one area that we're looking to develop our service over the next couple of years. And who was going to follow from um, Brad, who was in the process of talking about um, the new early warning systems that have been developed by the Bureau over the last couple of years. So we're looking at drawing upon that uh, excess heat factor calculations and the early warning uh, mechanisms that are coming into play in the next couple of years and how we can tailor our service to call people who are actually experiencing those significant heat events in where they are in the state. So um, that map is just, it is made up. Um, it is just uh, an indication of what any given day during summer could look like in South Australia. We're a big state and the weather can change quite dramatically from the far north where it can, it is normal to be in those, those 40 degree weather days um, up for the north, but down the southeast, closest to the Victorian border, um, if they experience weather like that, that is significantly uh, impacting for our vulnerable people down in the southeast. So it's about tailoring the service to actually respond where it's best needed. So we're not just calling everybody depending on um, where they're experiencing that excess heat. Um, and that's really key for how we can develop a service into the future is working with partners with the Bureau, state emergency services, et cetera. And final slide, please. So what's next and a bit more exciting for Telecross Ready is we're looking at expanding the service model to include other um, extreme weather events and not just extreme heat. Um, and how our vulnerable people are impacted by extreme cold or storms, bushfires, et cetera, and how we can support those, that same pre-registered client group during other events. But we are also in the process of supporting other states and national societies um, to pilot their own local heatwave service, um, duplicating Telecross Ready. So we're helping another state, particularly in Australia at the moment, develop their own heatwave service. And in the last, only in the last couple of weeks, we've been contacted by the International Federation Red Cross to work with another national society in Europe to pilot a telecross ready service potentially in this European summer or next summer in Europe, which is um, really exciting for us to be able to share this service that we've spent the last 11 years um, developing further. So it's a bit exciting for the next couple of years to how we can um, share our best practice further. And that's a very quick summary of telecross ready in Australia. Thank you. Thanks, Alana. Um... Two things, one, jumping into the breach while we uh, went to find Brad. We found Brad, which is great. Um, and again, always always um, great to hear about the Telecross Ready. There are a bunch of questions for you, so um, get ready to answer those. Brad, we're gonna come back to you. Um, we figure the duct tape and the rubber bands have been connected again on the NBN. Yeah. So um, yeah, we'll back, back to you to uh, hopefully you can pick up where you left off. Thanks very much, John. And yes, apologies to everybody for that. Um, and that was the slide. Thanks, Greg. So um, onto the trial heat wave warnings issued during last season. Um, as you can see on the screen, there were 266 uh, warnings issued nationally. Uh, the vast majority of those were issued for northern and western parts of the country. And that was actually also aligned to the actual fire weather season that we saw. Of course, it was reasonably cool, moist and wet over the eastern seaboard. Um, so we had 81 warnings issued for Western Australia, 51 for the Northern Territory and 65 for Queensland. Our trial heatwave warnings were issued for all state and territories with the exception of the ACT. And there's an example of the graphics uh, from the trial heatwave warnings on the right hand side of the screen with examples from Western Australia, Tasmania and Queensland. Note also in the graphics, um, we indicate the area of low intensity heat wave in the yellow shading, which is not part of the warning service, but consistent with our forecasts. The, um, the orange shading indicates areas of severe heat wave and the red indicates areas of extreme heat waves. Uh, thanks, Greg. On to the next slide, please. So in terms of um, feedback from our customers, it was generally positive. And following on from the engagement that I described previously, um, there was a lot of engagement with the partner agencies early in the life of the project. Uh, we wanted to check in at various points during the, the trial, particularly at the end of the trial. And so we'll use all that feedback that we received in incorporating our services and particularly the heatwave warnings as we prepare for the heatwave warnings to be live to the public for the 22-23 season ahead. Uh, next slide, thanks Greg. The National Heatwave Warning Framework, um, the Bureau has co-led the development of a National Heatwave Warning Framework that essentially agrees to a nationally consistent approach to managing heatwave risk. 
Uh, the purpose of the framework is to provide the foundation for a consistent approach to heat health and the heat wave warnings across Australia and the territories. The primary intent of the framework um, is to reduce uh, health impacts from heat waves, um, noting that heat waves adversely impact sectors, including the water, energy, infrastructure, agriculture, and transport sectors. So this is a very important document. We're getting very close to finalizing this, this framework and it will be used as the guiding document uh, moving forward. Uh, if we go to the next slide, thanks, Greg. So what's next? Um, the pathway to the public heatwave warning service. Uh, we're certainly supporting the operational readiness of our partners. Uh, what are we doing internally in the Bureau? Uh, we're looking at updating and refining our standard operating procedures at our stops, additional training of our staff. We had training last season before the, the trial warnings were were issued, so ongoing training for our staff, also technical readiness and looking at scenario testing, and very importantly, maintaining the communication and the engagement with the community and particularly with our health and emergency services friends. And we aim to issue public heat wave warnings um, with the start of this season, which is from the 1st of October, uh, 2022. We go to the next slide, thanks, Greg. So for further information, um, you can please refer to the Heatwave Knowledge Centre. There's a lot of information contained on this particular web page, including understanding heatwaves, information about our services and preparing for heatwaves and a whole lot more. So the web address is on the screen there and that's linked from the heatwave section from the Bureau's webpage. Uh, thank you very much, John. And again, apologies for that, that issue before. Uh, all good, Brad. These things happen. Um, we're, fortunately, we we're able to sort of uh, um, get Alana to jump in, which was terrific. Um, so I'm going to move on uh, now to uh, consider a, us as a consider a, a challenge with heat, which is um, sort of not, not well sort of uh, thought about. Um, you know, we often think about sort of physical impacts of heat, but there's also a significant mental health uh, impact. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Jingwen Lu and also um, Blesson Vargas uh, from uh, University of Adelaide uh, and South, South Australian Health to talk about some research that they've been doing on the mental health impacts of, um, of heat. So over to you both. Oh. Thank you very much, John, for the wonderful introduction and the invitation to speak today. I'm really excited to be here sharing some of the work in our team around the mental health effect of ambient heat exposure. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So let's start with what we have all experienced. Uh, from time to time, we hear about how global warming has changed the Earth's climate pattern. In many countries or regions, there's an increase in temperature in all season, which results in more frequent, longer, and stronger heat wave. And there are many studies in field have reported the adversely health effect of heat. For example, dehydration, heat stress, heat stroke, and a lot of other direct effects that are associated with extreme heat exposure. And we also know that um, heat has the ability to trigger aggregation of some underlying health condition, like, for example, exacerbation of renal insufficiency and cardiovascular illnesses. Our team has done a lot of research that has demonstrated the impact of extreme heat exposure across a range of health endpoints, as well as across the lifespan. Why we do know a lot about the physical health impact of extreme heat, Relatively less is known about the mental health impact of hot weather. So next, I want to focus more on the mental health component. Le next slide, please. <clears throat> According to the recent Global Burden of Disease study, more than one in 10 people live with a mental health issue, which accounts for 5% of disease burden worldwide. And with the increasing study report the link between high temperature and a range of mental health illnesses. Um, in the recent release sixth iteration of IPCC report, 
Mental health is mentioned over a hundred times in the document. Uh, specifically, it's 147 times. Next slide, please. Our recent research summarized the evidence, which is also the first to quantify effect of high temperature on mental health outcome worldwide, was published last year. And I want to walk you through the results of that paper. We include total of 53 observational study in our review that comprise over 1.7 million mental health related mortality and 1.9 million morbidity cases. And the finding shows that despite the heterogeneity in environmental condition and population dynamic among the review study, the evidence today support a link between elevated ambient temperature and mental health outcome with increased risk of 2.2% for mortality and 0.9% for morbidity per one degree Celsius increase in temperature. Next slide, please. The other thing <clears throat> I want to highlight from this study is that when we look at the specific mental health impact, we found that the highest effect of mortality was were due to substance related mental disorder with increased risk of almost 5%, following with organic mental disorder with increased risk of 3% and suicide. While for morbidity, the highest risk was attributable to mood disorder, organic mental disorder, following with schizophrenia and neurotic and anxiety disorder. We also find that the impact of heat on mental health was similar across age group. Although higher heat uh, although higher risk was found for elderly adults, we know that this is a problem for adults of all ages as well. Another thing that is really important to mention about is, we might think, well, are not people who live in warmer region mm -hmm. already used to those extreme high temperature? And what we are able to show from our review is that we did observe higher baseline temperature for mental health morbidity in people who live in lower latitude region. While an increased risk was also found in people living in tropical region. In this regard, I think there are lessons that can be learned from this work is those living near the equator that are experiencing warmer temperature now. Probably the people who living in higher latitude region might also experience in the coming decade as a result of global warming. Next slide, please. To sum up, our study support the link between high temperature and the risk of poor mental health outcome. Using the evidence from the systematic review, what we are doing now is to quantify the national heat attributable burden of mental health related disease, and also the other climate sensitive disease in Australia. Now I will invite Dr. Blessen Wagis to present evidence specific in Australia. All right, thanks Jasmine. Uh, so I'm just gonna very quickly give an overview of the work that I did when, uh, when I was working with the Bureau of Meteorology on a multi-agency collaboration project between the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the Department of Health and, and the Geoscience Australia. So this project called uh, Reducing Illness and lives lost from heat waves was mostly about understanding the impact of heat waves on health outcomes, both morbidity as well as mortality, as well as trying to understand uh, which areas are at risk and uh, the population characteristics uh, of people who are most vulnerable during heat waves. So that this, uh, so, so that this evidence can be used to better inform uh, the heat warning systems. So next slide, please. So essentially what we did was we 
used the Bureau of Meteorology's excess heat factor definition to define our heat waves and looked at health outcomes uh, across both morbidity as well as mortality. And this included the presentations to the GP uh, emergency department as well as the death records over uh, a period of time. And what essentially what we did was we quantified the risk uh, at a spatial scale uh, across um, Australia. And then to further understand what are the um, area level vulnerability factors, we linked demographic and socioeconomic factors, health, health factors, and natural and built environment factors to each of those SA2 areas to better understand the spatial variability of uh, health risks during heat waves. And finally, we were also able to do some person level linkage, uh, in particular with the GP uh, data as well as the death data, where we were able to identify the person level characteristics that make people to be more vulnerable to health effects during heat waves. So next slide, please. So what did we find? So we found that uh, there was a significant impact um, on health outcomes during heat waves across the health system from presentations to GP, emergency department, as well as uh, death. But the key point is that this impact is not the same across the country with the impact highly spatially uh, heterogeneous. And what we found in our area level as well as person level linkage analysis was a set of consistent risk factors that may explain the spatial uh, patterns of risk. So what we found uh, was areas with, uh, with higher prevalence of people with low household income, uh, those who are living alone, uh, people with no access to vehicle and having health conditions such as diabetes and mental health conditions were more at risk during heat waves compared to non-heat waves. Um, so next slide, please. So finally, I'd like just to acknowledge our team at the University of Adelaide, uh, as well as uh, our collaborators uh, with whom we have worked extensively for the last 10 to 15 years in, in the heat health space and happy to answer any questions after. Thank you very much. Thank you, Blesson, and thank you, Jingwen, um, for uh, an, another sort of um, example of, of the, uh, the impact of extreme heat. Um, thanks to all of our, our presenters um, working through all of our technical um, challenges. And uh, so uh, what I want to do now, there's a, there's a uh, bunch of questions in the, um, the Q&A, which has been uh, terrific. Uh, so um, we might we've got, we've got a little bit of time, uh, so we'll try and uh, get through as, as many as, as we can. Uh, Brad, I'm going to come to you because there's a, a couple of questions which um, I'll, I'll try and uh, um, bring these together. Um, but um, Kelly G uh, has sort of asked, um, you know, will the bureau be sort of looking towards more localized temperature monitoring? because uh, it's sort of important for um, understanding heat variability and providing heat waves on a local scale. Uh, but she's also asked, um, and perhaps you can kind of bring this to, to, together, uh, she's also asked sort of around, uh, a question around, does the Bureau uh, consider humidity as part of its sort of uh, heat, heat wave warnings? Sure, thanks, John, and thanks, Kelly, for the question. I'll address the second one first. So we don't directly account for humidity in the heat wave calculations, the excess heat factor, but we do take into account minimum temperature. So in a way it is indirectly factored in because with uh, humidity and, and dew point, the minimum temperature cannot drop below the dew point. So it's indirect, indirectly factored in, but not specifically. Um, in terms of the more localized information, um, I touched on the Heatwave Decision Support product, which provides very detailed um, Heatwave forecasts and warnings based on locations. So that particular product uh, for all major locations indicates the excess heat factor and uh, if that particular location is in a severe or extreme heatwave. 
And that combined with other factors from that product, such as the percentage of a forecast district under uh, each heat wave severity category, I think will certainly help provide more localised information. And that will complement the, the broader sort of heat wave warnings and heat wave graphics that the, the Bureau is producing. Thanks, John. Great, uh, thanks, Brad. Uh, there are a couple of other questions uh, in the Q&A, which I might actually get you to have a look at. Um, sure. Yeah, yeah, just to sort of uh, answer those um, uh, directly. Um, I'd like to sort of pose, um, you know, as uh, I'd like to pose a question to you, um, Roop. Um, you've worked on a uh, heatwave guide for um, cities, and I'm I'm just interested if you could just give a sort of, you know, a, a kind of very brief sort of um, overview of what that that is. Yeah, absolutely. So we, a couple of years ago, ago, we got together and we wrote this guide basically saying if you're a city and you have never worked on heat waves before, all the way to being a city that already has an early warning system, what are some of the things and entry points that you can have to engage on heat? So um, that guide sort of works you through the process. So how do you recognize who's the most vulnerable in your city? Um, how do you get different departments within your city sort of mobilized? Maybe you need to get the mayor's office communicating with uh, the emergency department amongst other things. Um, we also have a section on sort of longer term planning. So um, aside from just when a heat wave is happening, what can you do in terms of planning for planning in your city for heat waves? So things like green spaces, cool roofs, white roofs, um, amongst many others. Um, so that's all available at the link that was shared earlier. Great, thank you, um, Roop. And um, I'd like to come back to, to Blesson on, on Jingo and, and thinking about it from a research perspective of what you've um, presented. Um, how does this sort of uh, translate to sort of public policy, I suppose? How can we kind of make that shift from, from what you found into, you know, what, what we should be doing uh, as, as agencies, as, as governments, uh, uh, and others. Um, so, yeah, um, I think that's a really good question. And just want to, uh, I mean, um, so our team at the University of Adelaide, uh, led by P P Professor Pang B, has been extensively involved in the heat health research in South Australia. And so, a lot of actions that that like that actually happened in you know in South Australia has been informed by the evidence and the research from our team, uh, which involved in partnerships with the Department of Health in SA Health here. So I think the examples um, that was mentioned. So I think from our perspective, we've always looked at you know uh, what has been done after the evidence has been generated, and how can we better you know, I mean, improve um, in terms of reducing the, I mean, I mean, the burden of health outcomes during heat waves. So essentially what we've done is collaborated with the policy makers as like stakeholders, given them the evidence and facilitated workshops or discussions and possibly, I mean, uh, you know, um, help them write guidance documents that they can use going forward. And I'll, I just want to touch one example that we did uh, in regards to outdoor workers being mentioned as a high risk group. So that was during my PhD where I did uh, look at the impacts of heat on occupational settings. And we worked very closely with uh, Safe Work Australia and we helped uh, them to write their national safe work guide on working in the heat. Uh, and then I think that's pretty much what we can do as like researchers, give them evidence, and then they have to take it further from there. And, and the work that I presented during this talk about the Bureau's work on the reducing illness and life loss from heat waves has had an impact on, you know, influencing the stakeholders and, and the agencies uh, going forward on how uh, tailored the services can be, uh, especially from the B Bureau's perspective. So. Great, thanks, Blesson. Um, we're probably getting towards the end, but I'm going to pose a question to you, Alana, from um, Sue Campbell uh, in in Queensland. Um, 
probably you know, how how's Red Cross work going to be available in other states? Well, this is something that we are working on uh, more broadly through uh, a, a, a new sort of strategy. Um, but I want to kind of, if you could, um, I guess, uh, the work that you do, um, how is it collaborative with other so care service providers, um, you know, who, who, you know, who do work with people more at, more at risk? Yeah, so um, I should have probably mentioned earlier how we get our pre-registered clients. Some of them are self-registered, but we also have relationships with some other care providers in South Australia. So uh, RDNS and one of the other aged care providers, for example, we've had these partnerships for a couple of years where each uh, leading up to each summer, they will provide us with a, a referrals of clients that they've already identified as being high risk and in need during extreme weather events. And we're actually looking at the moment at expanding our, our program within South Australia at the moment, how other service providers similar to aged care, disability services, mental health providers across the state um, can partner with Red Cross and how we can um, broaden our reach and reach more people who are highly vulnerable during heat waves. And we get those referrals in from those service providers and we can engage with those service providers about how we can escalate any, any needs that come up so we can go back to them and go with contacted this many people from your client list, but these people haven't answered. Are you able to follow up and um, ensure that they're, they're safe at home at the moment? So we are looking at broadening that with more partners at the moment. We've had a number of on and off different health healthcare providers across the state, aged care in particular um, over the last 11 years, but that's something that's building at the moment. And it's the same with other states as well as just looking at who we can partner with to, to grow the service some more. Fabulous, thanks Alana, that, that's great. And um, look, I'd just like to um, thank all of our I'm back again. Sorry, I got muted. Um, or muted myself. Um, yeah, look, I'd just like to thank all our, our presenters today for making making their, their, their time available, uh, particularly Ruth, is, you know, can go off and have uh, dinner or, 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 or whatever uh, from coming into us from New York, but everyone else, of course, um, also uh, uh, providing uh, so what I think was, um, I hope you found was really uh, useful and, um, and you start to think about what this might, might mean for you. Uh, our regional office of um, the, the Red Cross based in Kuala Lumpur has a, uh, has a network, uh, sort of regional heat network, which I'm just going to pop in, the, um, in the, the chat if people are interested in, in joining that sort of network. Uh, it talks right across the, sort of the Asia, Asia Pacific region. Uh, so again, great, great opportunity to sort of share. Um, so again, thank you for your time. Um, I was going to say stay warm, uh, which for, for those of us here, uh, you know, certainly in the southern states, um, but uh, I guess the thing is to stay safe and sort of uh, happy International uh, Heat Action Day. Thank you very much.